Hey, hope you're doing okay this evening. Just wanted to go through the Word of God and just uh, give a teaching today on the presence of God and how prosperity comes uh, through the through the presence of God. Now, the moment we say prosperity, people typically think that prosperity only uh, means wealth. It only means financial abundance. But prosperity um, is not exclusively about finances is not exclusively about money about money uh, prosperity basically just means abundance and abundance could refer to an abundance of children it could refer to an abundance of money it could refer to an abundance of wisdom abundance of knowledge uh, there are different ways in which we can measure abundance there are different ways in which we can measure prosperity and what we get from this story is about uh, how uh, when somebody becomes satiated, uh, satiated or, or saturated or, or full of the presence of God, when somebody uh, gives their life over as a living sacrifice to seek the face of God, to be in, in the presence of God, how that can result in you being very, very prosperous. And there are numerous stories actually in, in the Bible which communicate this principle. I can think of Abraham. Abraham was 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 blessed in all things. He, he was old, and at that old age, God had blessed him in all things. The same thing happened to Isaac. Um, Isaac went to sow in the land of the Philistines, and he sowed in that land, and he reaped a hundredfold in the space of one year. If you uh, follow the story onwards, he then went out, and he was digging up wells, and there was abundance of water. Wherever he went, he, he just seemed to have breakthrough because he was a man of covenant. He was a man of the of the presence of God. But this story that I have today comes from First Chronicles chapter 13. And um, as an introduction, it's about the Ark of, of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was one of the instruments uh, that was erected in the Holy of Holies, uh, which was uh, before the times of the, uh, the, of the temple, we had the tabernacle, which Moses had been instructed to build. And the Holy of Holies would be the place uh, where the, the priest, the high priest, would come in once a year to offer up sacrifices unto God and unto, uh, for the sins of the people and also for uh, the sins that he had committed over the course of the year. And what would happen is God would come down and he would rest on the Ark of the Covenant. If you're familiar with the stories in Exodus and in Numbers, you will see that there were many times that once the tabernacle was erected, that God would literally come down and, and he would come down in a cloud. Now, I'm, he, I, I'm not saying that he was the cloud, but I believe what it was is that the cloud was hiding his glory. The, the cloud was was hiding his appearance. But God would would, would come down um, just as he came down on the mountain before uh, uh, they received the Ten Commandments. God would come down and God would would in, would actually be um, communing with with Moses in um, in the tabernacle. So... What happens in this story is that David uh, understands the importance of the Ark of the Covenant. And so he decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh um, and to, to bring it into, into Jerusalem. Into, into I mean, Yeah, I believe it was Jerusalem where he wanted to bring it into, uh, where he, he was based. I believe, yeah, he was based. Well, he was based, he was, it was based in Judah. He was based in the south. Um, and he definitely wanted to bring it down into Judah. And what was actually quite strange is that in the time of, of David, uh, David actually replaced um, the tabernacle insofar as um, he had a tent and he erected this tent. And what he would do is once he brought the Ark of the Covenant um, to Jerusalem, he put the Ark of the Covenant in the tent. And then what he did is he orchestrated um, a almost like a rotor system where the musicians and the Levites would stand before uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which again symbolizes the presence of God, and they would continually worship him. So David didn't really rely so much on um, the tabernacle, which was used in the time of Moses. But we, as we know, um, after after David died, Solomon was instructed and given the responsibility of building the actual temple, which was modeled very similar to, to um, the tabernacle, which Moses was instructed to build. Now, what happened in the story of the um uh with the ark of the covenant is that david consulted um 
with his people. They agreed with him. They said it's a great idea. Bring down the Ark of the Covenant. So they were on the course of or on the pro, in the process of bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. And as they brought the Ark of the Covenant back, um, there was a man called um, Uzzah and there was another man called um, Ahio. And they had like a cart um, to uh, to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And this was not something which uh, was instructed. Uh, so basically what happened is one of the, I think one of the oxen, um, you know, he stumbled. So the Ark of the Covenant was about to fall on the floor. And then Uzzah put his hand on the Ark of the Covenant. And according to the author of Chronicles, um, God struck him down. So, so Uzzah actually died before the Lord. And I mean, one thing we can learn from this story is that uh, if you read from verse Chronicles 13 to verse 8, it says that you know, David and all of Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and cymbals and with trumpets. And yet, because of what Uzzah had done, um, Uzzah still died. And what I, what I learned from that is that, uh, as the scripture says, there's a way which, which seemeth right unto man, um, and yet the path, the end of, of that work is death. And it's because God has designated a way in which he ought to be worshipped. And the only way in which we can please him is when we align ourselves in accordance to what he has designated. And God has always had a, a, a set way. Remember with Cain and Abel, Cain came before God with his vegetables, with his fruits. Abel came before God with, with worship which was worthy, uh, with a worship which I believe he had learned from his father. He'd learned from Adam and he'd understood that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So he, he came uh, with a lamb and he, he slaughtered that lamb and he offered that unto God and God was well pleased with his sacrifice. If we see, uh, in, you know, through, read the whole of Exodus or read the Leviticus, there is there were very stringent, strict laws that God had gave Moses that um, in, order, in, in order to be able to atone for their sins. And we know that in these last days, that the only way that somebody can receive an atonement, the only way in which somebody can receive forgiveness of sins is through the blood of Christ Jesus, the Son of God. So God is very, very specific. And the Bible says uh, that, um, I believe it was Christ. Christ was speaking to, I believe it was the Samaritan uh, woman. Well, let's get that scripture up in John chapter four. He was talking to the Samaritan woman. And um, okay, we read from verses 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You do not, you worship ye know, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him worship, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember the story of Aaron. Aaron had to, um, a number of sons and a couple of them offered strange fire unto God and God consumed them. So it's a very, it's actually a very risky um, thing um, to do to, to, especially if you're not called um, to the ministry. Um, it's very, very risky to, to get yourself involved because if you're not doing it the right way, then um, there will be condemnation. Um, that's why James, um, the, I believe the brother of Christ in, in his epistle, his general epistle to the church, James said, do not be, be teachers over many matters, knowing that you will receive greater condemnation. So it is very important. Remember what, again, what happened to uh, Korah. They felt that they should be, you know, ministers, men of God. You know, they, they approached um, Moses and Aaron. They offered strange fire again unto God. And we, we know the predicament that they faced. The earth swallowed them up and they died and they were swallowed alive. So when we come when we come to do the work of god we need to to consecrate ourselves we need to spend a sufficient amount of time in the word there are many people that they they have these teachers these false teachers that they listen to um you know we're living in a time of youtube and on the basis of what they've heard um from these false teachers 
they then go and, and, and um, deliver messages and teachings on the strength of those false teachings um, without actually have, having spent sufficient time in the word of God. We saw in the case of, uh, of Paul, if we go to Galatians, we saw that Paul spent a, a very long time seeking the face of God and, and getting in the word of God in the Old, in the Old Testament before he began his ministry. And you, you would know this because when uh, you read his letters, whether they be Romans or Galatians or, uh, or any other letter, really, he, he quotes quite extensively from the Old Testament. So he, he spent a lot of time in the Old Testament and he recognised that many of the, the prophecies from the Psalms, uh, from the prophets and from the law were all pointing towards uh, Christ, the man that he had an encounter with. So if we go to Galatians, we see what Paul did before he began his ministry. And we know that Paul had a, a very special ministry. I mean, I believe God anointed Paul like he's probably never anointed a man like he anointed Paul. He may well have uh, since then, but not very many men as as uh, were, were as anointed or, or were used as mightily in, in even the history of the church as Paul was. But look what Paul said he did. In um, in Galatians chapter 1, he said, Neither went I up to Jerusalem, so this is when he was saved, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went unto Arabia and returned unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So uh, what Paul did is, and remember this is a time without any internet, this is a time where people, I mean... This is just the advent of Christianity. So he's not reading books about what people have to say about Jesus. He learned about Jesus through, through studying the word of God. He learned about Jesus through seeking the face of, of Jesus. And he, he was doing that for three years. And then he said that, if you, read, uh, if you read a bit more on, he said that when he went to Jerusalem, he met up with, with James. Um, he, he, he met up with Peter as well. And these were obviously, these were, were the pillars in the faith. Um, they had already been in the faith for a number of years before Paul had um, received Jesus Christ and was baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. And what he recognised is that the doctrine that he had was exactly the same because he received the doctrine by revelation. So there was a time actually in the early church when the apostles and the disciples thought that salvation was only for the Jews and then we know that Peter had an encounter uh, with the Lord. He had a vision and, and a God sent him to the household of Cornelius. And then when he went to Cornelius, um, God poured out the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius and his household. And they all started speaking in, in, in tongues. They received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Paul received this revelation as well. In fact, Paul would go as far to call himself a, a preacher, a minister unto the Gentiles. And they had exactly the same doctrine because the doctrine came by the spirit. The doctrine was given to them by Jesus. And in that doctrine, I mean, a, a, a doctrine which is often rejected today um, is the doctrine of baptism, the need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And that was part of, um, of Paul's revelation from Jesus Christ. And that was also what Jesus Christ had instructed the apostles and the disciples to do before he uh, he ascended into heaven. So what we need to do in this time that we have is spend time with Jesus Christ in his word uh, so that Jesus Christ can teach us how to worship him and how to worship him in a way which is acceptable. So we go back to First Chronicles chapter 13. So Uzzah, Uzzah actually ended up dying um, Uzzah's had his life cut short because of that. And then the Bible says, my people perish out of ignorance. I don't know. I don't get the impression that he did that intentionally. He did it knowing that he was defying the ways of God. But you, God ought to be feared because the reality is, just as we saw in this story, God can literally just smite you. The Lord can send one of his angels. The angels can just smite you like that. And, um, you know, God is not unfair uh, there, there must have been a reason why he killed Uzzah. We don't know the type of person that Uzzah was. Maybe God had, maybe Uzzah did know. We, I, I can't really conclusively say, but I think what we get from this is you ought to fear God. You know, in verse 14, it says that David was displeased because the Lord had brought, had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, the place is called Peru's Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, how should I bring the ark of God home to me? 
So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and then verse 14, and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Amen. So what happened is David understood, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to inquire of the Lord. I'm not going to be so hasty and move the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know what God is going to do, how he's going to react if I, if I, um, if I start moving it again. So he left it in the house of Obed-Edom. Presumably Obed-Edom lived fairly close to where this incident had taken place. And as we read in verse 14, it says that God blessed Obed-Edom. He blessed his family and he blessed everything that he had. So that term bless, it, it basically means to prosper, to increase, um, to improve and um, to favour. And what this scripture is showing us is that the ark of God, which is symbolic for the presence of God, the ark of God or the presence of God is what brings blessings in your life. And let me just say that blessings can take many different forms. But I really believe in this instance is talking about um, is talking about his health. And the Bible says about Moses that Moses, uh, at the age of 120 before he died, that his body was in a perfect condition. It was in a very, very good condition. So he had good health. And we know that Moses was a man that would, would sometimes spend 40 days on a mountain, not eating, not drinking just communing with God. There was a time where he came down, he interceded for Israel after they started worshipping a golden calf. And as he as he finished his 40-day fast, he came down, 40 days of intercession, he came down and his face was shining and he didn't even know. So uh, I believe when he was blessed, it means that his health was blessed. Um, and as I said before, there are other things. He said that his family was blessed. So maybe there was peace in the home uh, with his wife with his children, perhaps his children were, 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 were living ruly, uh, they were living good, um, they were doing well, you know, in their, in their studies, uh, they were living righteously. And, and as well as that, I'd imagine that maybe Obed-Edom, if he had a, 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 a livelihood, maybe he was doing well in his livelihood as well. I really believe that God is a God that can bless you financially. I mean, according to De Deuteronomy 28, this can be so. And then according to um, many other stories of people who walked with God, this is something which God can do. So what we just gained from this message is about um, how favour, how blessings, how prosperity comes through through the life um, of God. It comes through somebody who spends a sufficient amount of time with God. I mean, uh, Obed Edom was so blessed that the word came round to David and David was like, okay, no, we need to go and take this Ark of the Covenant now. We can't just leave it here. I need to receive uh, these blessings as well myself. So that they did exactly that and they prepared it and they uh, they prepared it properly and then they um, they took it properly with the Levites and the Levites had to sanctify themselves. And that that's actually very interesting because if you go on to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, um, from verses 12 and this is David speaking and he said unto them you are the chief of the fathers of the Levites sanctify yourselves both ye and your brethren that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it so it's almost like you have to be sanctified in order to be able to possess the the presence of God you can't you can't like an undefiled individual cannot sufficiently carry the presence of God you need to you need to become holy you need to consecrate yourself you need to prepare yourself I mean you you can't even get into the presence of God unless you come through Christ Christ is the is the offering Christ is the sacrifice Christ said I'm the way the truth and the life that no man can come to the father except through me so you you need to be in a right standing with Christ and uh to be in a right standing with Christ you need to obey Christ um, Jesus Christ said, I believe in John 14 verses 23, he says, if you, in fact, let me just get the scripture up. John 14 verses 23. 
You know, another way to sanctify yourself is through the through the word of God. In John 17, 17, it said, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 14, verses 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So you can say, oh, I'm baptised in the name of Jesus. I speak in, in tongues. And that's a great start. However, in walking with God, in progressively consecrating yourself unto God, you must take up your cross, as Jesus said, and deny yourself every single day. And that is going to require require us to engage in spiritual practices every day and for me spiritual practices include things like fasting includes things like praying and of course it includes the word of God not only being hearers of the word of God but also doers of the word of God so in order to possess the presence of God in order to be able to um, stand before God you have to be you have to be holy the Bible says that uh, follow peace and holiness with all men without which no man can see the Lord where in Exodus chapter 19 when God was speaking to Moses God told Moses that he was coming down on on Mount Sinai I believe it was and God told Moses to tell them that they had to consecrate themselves they had to sanctify themselves for three days the men couldn't sleep with their wives they had to wash their clothes you know to, to stand before God so something as small as as being clean you know, being physically clean, having, uh, you know, hygiene is, is important to stand before God because I think we fail, often fail, including myself, to recognise that God is a king. This is the, remember the Bible says this is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. God is a king and his son is the king of all kings. So if you were to stand before the Queen of England today, uh, you would you would you would make sure you're well groomed you know hopefully uh, <laughs> you would but you would wash yourself you brush your teeth you maybe put a bit of perfume on you would look presentable to stand before the queen so but yet when we're with god we don't feel that we need to do that our room is untidy and we try and pray we don't prepare ourselves sufficiently to stand before him not knowing that he's he's actually there and he's watching you and he sees your heart and he knows everything about you. And he knows even why you're approaching him if you're doing it for, because you want to seek his will. Or, or whether you're just doing it because you want your own will um, to be fulfilled. Remember the Bible says that, um, that uh, was it, that Moses, forget it up, Psalm 103 verse 7, I think it is. Yeah, he, he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. So there's a difference between knowing the ways of God and knowing the acts of God. Many people know the acts of God. You can go out evangelizing and see somebody get healed. That's the acts of God. You, you can go to um, you can go to a an assembly and some uh, the man of God is prophesying there. And again, he's and he's given accurate word of knowledge. These are examples of the acts of of God. However, the ways of God is, is more to do with, with him as a being, how, how he actually is, his temperament, his, uh, the things that he likes, the things that he doesn't like. And whilst the word of God is definitely exceptional and, and necessary in revealing this, God, God is not the word of God. If you know what I mean, God, like the word of God are words that have been inspired by God. You know, the Bible says that, that prophecy did not come by interpretation, but it was uh, given to holy men as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that is what the Bible is. It's, it's a collection, a compendium of uh, revelation from different men of God. But God is outside of the book. God is, a, is an individual. And there is, I believe there's a lot more that God can reveal um, unto every single one of us. You know, even to this very day, there, there are different revelations we can learn uh, individually about, the, about God. And the only really way we can do that is by being holy, by, by sanctifying ourselves are spending sufficient time in the presence of God. And this is really what's going to bring um, the presence of God into our lives. Um, now, I've, I believe I've said everything that maybe could be said tonight. Um, 
If we just go back to First Chronicles chapter 15. Yeah, so from verses 14. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to, to bring up the ark of God, ark of the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Amen. There's another thing actually I want to talk about very briefly about the presence of God and, and a way in which um, the presence of God um, can become manifest in your life. Um, one thing I will say is that and it's probably the, the one principle I'll talk about tonight, is about the importance of sacrifice. And um, in seeking God, there's going to be a big amount of sacrifice that you're going to um, have to engage in. You may have plans and ambitions, but because there's a massive time restraint and time is limited for all of us, you're going to have to make the decision of choosing the presence of God over all of these other ambitions that will not help you fulfill your calling in Christ. And this is this is what sacrifice is about. Sometimes you will not want to uh, to pray. And I really believe in, in terms of the times that I've really experienced God. And when I say experienced God, I mean being full of the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Ghost. You know, you read in the book of Acts, there were certain men um, who were full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen was one of those men. Philip, uh, the evangelist, was one of those men. Peter, Paul, these were men full of the Holy Ghost. Now, what, what did they say to, to Peter? Uh, and what did Peter respond? You know, in Acts chapter 6, they, there, was a, there was a quarrel between um, some of the Grecians and, and some of the Jews, between the widows. and uh, um, uh, You know, there was a big quarrel amongst them. And word got round to the apostles. And, and what did Peter say? He said, it's not meant for us to serve tables, but we will give ourselves continually unto the ministry of the word and to prayer. So, and these were men that, that were moving mightily. These were men that uh, were doing remarkable miracles, healing people, uh, raising people from the dead. Um, shadows would, would cast out, you know, unclean spirits or, or heal people. So these were, they were, they were moving in mighty, mighty, mighty signs. But these were men that consecrated the, the whole life, sacrificed the whole life to prayer and unto the word of God. And now when we're talking about prayer, it's not the, the little prayer, 10 minute prayer here and there. I believe it's the prayer that, that Jesus Christ showed us. And I know that Jesus Christ told them uh, the, the prayer that we should pray our father who art in heaven. But we can't expect that that was the only prayer that Jesus was doing because there was a time where it said that Jesus prayed all night before choosing his disciples. So the, the, there were there were there were other prayers. There was you know Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, "Could you not wait one hour with me?" He was talking to the disciples. They they fell asleep. Peter, John, James. And he said, "Could you not at least tarry one hour?" So we're in prayer, you have to spend like you have to sacrifice a lot of time in prayer. Sometimes, you know, you've prayed one hour, and the spirit of God is, and you know that the prayer is not enough. The 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 things that you're battling with in the spirit. You can feel it is is telling you your spirit man is telling you you need to pray more than one hour at times, and it's a sacrifice. It's not easy because there are, there are other things you could be occupied with, but it's a sacrifice which is necessary. Um, Jesus Christ told the disciples, He said, "Tarry into in Jerusalem, into the gift of the Father, the promise of the Father be given unto you." And we know that 120 disciples prayed continuously, continuously amongst themselves. They were in continual fellowship. And then on Pentecost, the gift of, of the Holy Ghost was given to them. And that's the presence of God that was manifested upon their lives. It was the gift of God that was manifested upon their lives. And they started to speak in different tongues and they started to prophesy. And, and great mighty miracles and uh, were taking place. And, and Peter was preaching with boldness and 3,000 souls were added to the church in, in a single uh, in a single day because the presence of God was there. So this is what I'm saying. Like being blessed only comes through the through the the uh, the uh, the presence of God and whilst we're looking at the old covenant and you know in, in this regard being blessed might be money and I still believe as I said you can be blessed in different ways but in the eyes of the apostles the eyes of the, of these men of God that were so serious about Christ being blessed was being persecuted being blessed was was saving thousands of souls you know there's a story where um, you know the apostles were whipped 
Um, let me go get that story up in Acts chapter 4, I believe. They were getting whipped, they were getting beaten up for preaching the gospel. And look how they responded to, to, to doing this. Or look how they responded in after getting persecuted. Or I bet actually it might be Acts. It might be Acts chapter 5. Yeah, Acts chapter 5 from verses 41. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to, to suffer shame for his name. So in their eyes, that was a, that was being blessed, getting beaten up. Um, and in verse 32, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So there's different ways God can manifest a blessing, but the only way that the blessing can really, really occur in one's life is through um, the presence of God. So sacrifices, that's what we want to um, get ourselves involved in. Let me just finish off with this scripture. Um, another story about David in Chronicles. So there's a story where David numbered uh, the children of Israel and um, he got punished as a result for doing that. So God um, instructed him to, to build an altar, I believe it was. Um, yeah, God told him to put an altar. So from verses 26, First Chronicles 21 from verses 26. And David built an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of, of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel. So, so that fire, you know, in, um, you know, in the Bible, sometimes, uh, there are symbols, um, sometimes there are, there are shadows of things. And I think God, God's presence is often symbolised by, by a cloud. It's also symbolised by a, a, by a fire. Uh, the Bible says that in the days of the Exodus that he was with the children of Israel as a fire by night and a cloud by day. We know that when Jesus um, was... Um, being baptized and when Jesus was also on the Mount of Transfiguration that there came a cloud and, and the voice of God boomed in, from that cloud um, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear ye him um, fire you know day of Pentecost there was fire uh, I, can't, I can't remember if it was on their head or if it was on their tongues it, there was fire somewhere um, so fire and cloud and the cloud are, are symbolic of the presence of God and we saw here that as David built an, uh, an altar and he um, he offered up sacrifices on the altar. The fire of God came down. Exactly the same thing happened in the time of Solomon. And Solomon um, offered sacrifices unto God after they'd erected the temple. A fire came down from God, again, symbolizing the presence of God. So it's sacrifice, sacrifice. Times I felt the presence of God is, is after long hours of prayers, after getting in the word of God, uh, you know, especially evangelism, going out there, um, and ministering to people I've had it before where it's like God's presence is nowhere and then the moment I speak to a sing an individual and I tell them about Christ I'm full of, like maybe I might not notice it then I might feel fire as I'm talking to them but after I finish I'll I'll feel full of the Holy Ghost like I'll be full of the Spirit and for those of my brethren and sisters out there who, who receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost you will know what I mean it, what it means to be full of the Holy Ghost you can you know um there were people in the, in the New Testament, they were full of the Holy Ghost. We, we've been there ourselves as well. Now, evangelizing, ministering to people, again, that is a big sacrifice because you're not necessarily gaining, you're like, it's not like, it's not like going to work where you go to work. Let's say you've got a, a decent job, you've got a salary. At the end of each month, you, you have something tangible. But when you go to evangelize, like, you're moving with faith. Like, they, quite often, people are going to reject the word of God. And you're just moving in the faith that Christ is going to reward you um, for, for, for being obedient and faithful as a minister. But one thing that I do know is that God's presence comes down when we evangelize. So sacrifice is really the way in which we're going to be blessed. And I think that in these last days, God is going to, is going to bless people differently. I, I, I can't say in which way God is going to bless you. But there's one blessing, I think, which surpasses all blessings in my experience. 
And that blessing is the, is, is the blessing of peace. <laughs> peace. You read about Paul. Paul is always, always talking about the peace of God. And you see the things that Paul went through. And yet he was rejoicing in the peace of God. And I think, you know, as I said, from my life experience is that when we do the things of God, we sacrifice to God, we pray. Um, we offer sacrifices of, of thanksgiving, of praise. We get in the word of God and we evangelize as we're led by the spirit of God. Then... I'm certain that what will keep us strong and rooted and uh, will keep us enduring unto the end will be the peace of God. And as the Bible says, which surpasses all understanding. So if we just recap everything that had been said today, I think it, number one, it's very important to know how to worship God. And we're only going to know how to worship God when we get back to this. We get back to the scriptures, the word of God. We get back to the word of God. Once we know how to worship God, once we know about the doctrines of God, then... It's our priority to sacrifice unto God in the way in which God has, has deemed um, acceptable. And in doing so, God will bless us in a myriad of different ways. For some, it might be through wealth, um, through others. And, and for those out there who have an issue with wealth, let me just say that the Bible teaches us that through wealth, you know, the kingdom of God can, can actually be, can actually be um, pursued, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So we saw that, obviously, in the time of Moses, that the Israelites spoiled the Egyptians. They took a lot of gold and jewelry and, and various different um, expenses, and they used that to build the uh, the tabernacle. Same thing happened with David and Solomon, and then also similar thing happened in the Book of Acts in the beginning. We had men like Barnabas, who who must have been wealthy because he had a lot of land, and he sold all of that land and he gave it onto the the feet of the apostles. So wealth can be used, and well, I'm not saying God is going to bless everybody in that way, but that's one way. And as we've seen in before, in the case of Obed Edom, he may bless you. In the case of your family, he may bless you. Um, in the case of your health, um, but one thing I know God will bless His people in in these last days is is wisdom, is strength, is peace, is joy, is the fruit of the Holy Ghost. That is the way God is going to bless us in these last days, as we sacrifice, as we endure in God, as we continue to cleanse ourselves you know let me finish off with this last scripture let me show you how a man is cleansed according to the scripture let me show you how a man is cleansed if we go to ephesians chapter 5 and for my brothers out there as well who have wives this is how you cleanse your wife okay uh ephesians 5 verses um i'll read from 25 actually husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it um that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so to be holy and without blemish it's only possible through the word of God. It's literally only possible. It's not, you can be so prayerful, you can, be, you can love the fast, but if you do those things and you don't have the word of God in you, I, I can't see any way in which you can be sanctified. And I think that's consistent with, with, with Paul, with what he said here, and also with Christ, as, as we alluded to in John 17, verses 17, which you can read again. John 17, verses 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thank you so much for being with me tonight. God bless.